If you think corporations bought free speech before Now that they're human, they'll buy even more Yeah, their money has free speech to live by the free speech. Welcome to Alliance for Democracies, The Populist Dialogues. This cable access program is part of our effort to create a just society based on sustainable, equitable economy. Our guests today are Ted Gleichman, who is the chair of the uh, Beyond LNG Committee of the Oregon Sierra Club, and Madeline Elder, who is president of the Communication Workers uh, Local 7901. So welcome to both of you. Thank you. Uh, yeah. You know, we uh, are pleased to see both someone from labor and from the environmental movement here at the same table because so often we find or the perception is that you're usually at loggerheads with each other. Uh, <laughs> you mean green and blue? Right? Uh, green and not blue, us. Uh, not, 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 yeah, not individually, are. right, yes. Our, right, our yeah, seconds but the, are waiting outside and the duel will begin oh, okay. later on. <laughs> right, <yes. laughs> but later on, okay, right. But uh, the fact that you're here uh, also represents a convergence of interests for both labor and environmentalists, yes. uh, and particularly with regard to uh, free trade agreements, as we typically have called them, uh, and I know you prefer to call them corporate trade agreements. I do. Right. Yes, okay. I agree with them. Okay, and, and uh, so I will try to call them corporate uh, trade agreements. Uh, so we're talking about the NAFTA, we're talking about CAFTA, we're talking about the Trans-Pacific Partnership now. Mm -hmm. So talk just a bit about the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Well, um, I think the main thing about the Trans-Pacific Partnership is that it's no different it, from previous very problem-ridden corporate trade agreements, except that it, en it encompasses the entire Pacific Rim. And that's huge. And we're talking about countries that have almost virtual slave labor, like Vietnam, uh, the Philippines, um, places where there's a lot of there's not much democracy and there's a lot of oppression and so this is the global race to the bottom we've been talking about that ever since 1991 when NAFTA was put into effect and it hasn't gone away it's become increasingly worse and worse with each uh, corporate trade agreement that's that's come out so yes this is really a serious problem and a serious threat. Uh, and let me, let me make two basic points around this. Uh, first, the way that these things are structured now, and second, uh, the way that we ought to be thinking potentially about trade going forward. Uh, Sierra Club um, has, a, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll do a plug for our website, so sierraclub.org, the national website, slash trade, uh, and you get to what we call responsible trade. Because there ought to be a theory by which uh, nations could provide goods and services to each other fairly, honestly, openly. The problem that we have now is we've involved, uh, evolved into this globalized corporate monopoly capitalism what could possibly go wrong with that, uh, <laughs> to a situation where uh, these mega trade agreements aren't the way that people think about trade agreements. You know, we think about uh, uh, importing a raw material from one country and exporting a manufactured good to another country. That's not the deal anymore. These mega agreements, the, the Trans-Pacific Partnership covers 40% of the global economy because of the importance of the countries of the Pacific Rim. Uh, the United States and Japan being uh, the two biggest in this, but um, China's not part of this at this point, but they could become part of this. And we all know about the problems with, I, I don't know, can you say communist capitalism? Does that make mm. any sense at all? No. Yeah. No, it doesn't. It doesn't <laughs> make sense, but, but that's what it right. is. Right. The, and yeah. it, the, the, these problems with oligarchic, um, uh, capitalism in China, just like Russia, just like Syria, et, et cetera. So these deals are covering everything from 
uh, intellectual property, trademarks, patents, those kinds of questions, to pharmaceutical manufacturing at a time when uh, superbugs and chronic diseases uh, and uh, newly developing diseases are endemic throughout the world and yet Big Pharma is trying to manage and control all of that. Uh, to the more traditional issues, but also things like energy, which is a particular focus for Sierra Club, of course, because of the global climate crisis. And I, I recently had the chance to sit down with um, a number of other major Oregon environmental groups with a member of Congress. Uh, and uh, we, had a, we had a very good, what, what do the diplomats call it, a, a free and open exchange of views oh. <laughs> um, yeah. with, with, this, with this member of Congress. And um, uh, a, a very good talk, and it was really, really was productive in both directions, and I, I, we all appreciated it and respected that. But one of the things that's happened, for example, as part of the Trans-Pacific Partnership secret negotiations that involve 600 corporate lobbyists, and, and these dozen countries and um, s something more like s much closer to six than 600 representatives of civil society, green groups, labor, et cetera. I mean, I think there's a dozen maybe, something mm -hmm. like right, that. Right, just a handful. Just yeah. a handful. Right. Um, I said, so we're all very cognizant of how important sneakers are to Nike. All right, okay, good thing. We all need sneakers. Uh, and how Vietnam, with the terrible labor and environmental standards that you just referenced, Madeline, um, is a major, major supplier to Nike now. So what about just doing a sneaker deal between the United States and Vietnam, where all of the stakeholders, all of the global justice community, um, in addition to the corporate community, have a chance to weigh in on what's a fair way to buy and sell sneakers. Okay. Why do we have to wrap that in allowing Big Pharma to control all of the trade in pharmaceuticals for 40% of the global economy? Right. Well, mm -hmm. AIDS, AIDS drugs. As a perfect example. AIDS drugs, okay, have been around for a while. They should be, there shouldn't be any question about having generics of them so that they're affordable to the poorest people in the world, and yet they're not. And yet this exactly. agreement is saying, no, we want to charge the highest possible cost, right. which means that the AIDS epidemic really doesn't ever stop. It never gets under control because the big farmer has to have their profits before human human beings are cured. I mean, seriously. And so, uh, it's, it's very wrong. Yeah. It is wrong. So I, I heard with regard to Big Pharma that, that uh, they're uh, in, intending to increase the, the, the length of the patents themselves. Uh, and then they were uh, going to exclude something called data sharing or data exclusivity so that, uh, so that the the uh, generic manufacturers would not be able to use the original data proving safety, but they would have to do all that testing again themselves. A mm. uh, whole lot of things that I've heard. Uh, of course, well, but the that other may or may not be a good thing. Uh -huh. I mean, you know, sometimes Big Pharma tweaks their results on their data. They make sure no. that the data right. reflects safety, and so. Are that, you saying a huge corporation might actually all dis I'm saying, distort something to make more money? All I'm asserting is that may or may not be a good thing. I think the worst piece is the fact that, look, honestly, uh, technology is such and research is such that having a patent for that long doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. You know, there's so many changes going on. It doesn't make any sense. I understand what they really want to do is prevent China from just going ahead and taking that and just selling it themselves, you know, stealing the formula, selling it themselves, never giving any kind of credit right. to the original pharmaceutical company. You know, I, it, it's not that I'm very sympathetic to corporations, but I understand where well, their logic begins. Sure. And it's just goes exactly. out of control after a certain exactly. point. I had the privilege over the last few days of spending time with some uh, young filmmakers who've just put out a 
a remarkable, horrifying documentary about fracking in, in Pennsylvania, where they're from, and the same thing is happening throughout the United States and North America and spreading around the world. It's called Triple Divide. Um, and uh, the, the, the challenge that, that we're facing dealing with these things uh, is that government is not doing a good job of coping with the regulatory process against these huge uh, unending supplies of corporate money. But the, these kids, and you know, as, as an aging boomer, someone destroying the earth for their generation, um, uh, these kids came from, as they put it, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, you know, one of the first right. colonies. And the phrase struck me so strongly, the Commonwealth. Um, and that's the, what the corporate responsibility ought to be. I understand that it takes a billion or two billion dollars to develop um, a, a really good quality new drug. I don't have any problem. I mean, I have a daughter who's a neuroscientist. I don't have any problem with um, a corporation that does that work being fairly compensated over a period of time for that investment. But should they be permitted to do that in ways that destroy lives unnecessarily around the, around the world? I don't, I don't have any problem with Hollywood not wanting China to um, bootleg all their movies. I mean, I enjoy a good, a good uh, movie as much uh, as the next person. I especially like the uh, heartwarming tear jerkers, um, but uh, no doubt channeling my, you know, uh, my my inner feminine side. Uh, so that's uh, the uh, so so yes, th those kinds of intellectual property things should not be stolen. But what about a deal between the United States and China just on intellectual property? Let's try to work out that specific problem. Right. I mean, I think I think what you're pointing out, and what what is a is a concern for me is the whole is again the whole idea of sovereignty too. Yes. You know, the whole idea that um, that especially like fracking or whatever, we pass a law or even something very innocuous like the Buy American Law, the Oregon State Legislature passes. And some corporation from the Philippines, or who's based in the Philippines, who may not even be Filipino, uh, can sue the government for theoretical lost profits because of this by America. They can sue the state of Oregon for their theoretical lost profits on uh, junk that they want to sell to the state. And so, to me, um, that that seems innocuous, but when you start talking about things like anti-fracking laws, uh, and clean air laws, mm -hmm. uh, and of course labor laws which are never enforced, never enforced, none of the labor standards are ever enforced in any of these agreements, then you're starting to see that it's getting away from us so that when you go to the United States, it's now in a scale of one to five, one being the best and five being the worst, the United States is number four, is, is on the class four of labor rights, of, of so, labor so, things, so, only so. above Syria and Iraq and Afghanistan where it's just war and that's why there's no labor standards. Mm -hmm. I mean, when we're one step above that, that's ridiculous. So not number four, but class four out of yeah. five categories of labor right. standards. Exactly. And and so the countries that are in class one are like going to... Like Scandinavian countries, for mm -hmm. example. You know, there, th your point about th this issue of corporations being able to sue for theoretical lost profits uh, and the sovereignty issues that apply there. This is not one government saying to another government, your trade policies are hurting our businesses and let's work that right. out. Mm -hmm. and there are two examples in Canada right now that speak to both the environmental standards and the labor standards out of NAFTA and the WTO, the World Trade Organization, where these rights for corporations to sue for theoretical lost profits. So the govern government of Qu Quebec imposed a moratorium on drilling for shale gas, for fracking, for natural gas, 
under the St. Lawrence Seaway because of concerns about water pollution, which has been documented in hundreds of cases in this Especially situation. Especially West Virginia. Well, but I mean, under the St. Right Lawrence there. Seaway, I mean, what could possibly go wrong with that? <laughs> and so, and so yeah. uh, a, a company that had uh, drilling rights that they had purchased from landowners in, on the edges of the St. Lawrence Seaway uh, based in Colorado, uh, is now suing the government of Quebec for $200 million in theoretical lost profits. Not actual real money, just right. theoretical lost profits from what they think they could have gotten from the gas pulled out from under there. Right. And in Ontario, where the utilities are publicly owned, I mean, there's one big U Ontario public utility uh, program, they've developed one of the most robust solar um, and uh, wind uh, energy development programs um, on the planet uh, and they applied a by local standard to that working with the steelworkers union uh, and established a number of factories with modern high quality labor standards state-of-the-art environmental standards in terms of dealing with a lot of these uh, industrial processes and now Ontario and and it's been very successful, and they've, they've um, put up um, dozens of gigawatts of, of new renewable electricity that is not destroying the planet. Uh, right. And Japan now, now this is, this is the nation on behalf of its manufacturers, um, not an individual corporation like this Quebec example, but Japan has now sued Ontario uh, under these WTO regulations saying that this was an imposition on the right of their manufacturers to come in and sell uh, solar electricity to uh, the Ontario utility. And they won that case, but fortunately it took a few years and Ontario had already established some good quality local manufacturers. So there's still good jobs making renewable energy mm -hmm. in Ontario, but this, this whole model is broken. This, these massive corporate trade agreements are just a bad idea. Yeah, and then you were you're talking about the the uh, age drugs and and all, yeah. and all that. And there was a, a another case in Canada where Canada found that Eli Lilly uh, had proven that certain drugs actually did uh, what they were supposed to do, and so they denied patents. Uh, and these were manufactured by an American company. So under NAFTA, this American company is suing Canada uh, to put for their lost profits. Uh, and I forget what the figure is, and I'm going to say $300 million, something along that line, uh, for anticipated last lost profits. So uh, another example where corporations are suing other nations under these trade agreements, under the investor protection clauses, which is what we're talking and about. And the chilling effect of that is for nations not to pass laws that protect right. environments or that protect labor and right. so on. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think, I think that that brings me to where is the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement now in Congress? And so, uh, recently I spoke with staff for Senator Ron Wyden. Senator Wyden is the chair of the Senate Finance Committee. And uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement is not going to get to the floor unless it gets through him. Um, and that's what his staff said up front, and that's what is generally understood. Uh, and so he, he's looking at trade promotion authority. Trade promotion authority is where you pass, you pass yes or no, up or down, these trade agreements. The trade agreements are made with all these nations. They tell us that you can't amend them, so you just vote up and down. And so in the past, it's been called fast track. And we finally got rid of fast track uh, during the Bush administration. Uh, they didn't really get rid of it. It expired. It expired. Right, uh, but, I mean, it, yeah, they didn't right. renew it, which, right. is, mm -hmm. which is a positive thing. Mm -hmm. And so now there's calls for us to go ahead and do some more fast track where they, they give you 2,000 pages of a trade agreement and the congressperson has 24 hours to look at it and vote on it which is impossible and it's all under as you said earlier Ted it's all secret and so on and so you know uh, what Senator Wyden's staff has told me and has told several people is that he's working on something called smart track rather than fast track 
he wants more transparency. He said uh, he hasn't written it yet, and I mean, they've been working on it since April, and I suspect he hasn't written it yet because it's not going to be written till after the elections. That's just my opinion. It's mm -hmm. not a fact, okay? Sounds plausible. It's yeah. somewhat plausible. It's probably, but probably nothing they really want to deal with. But what they said an was right. yeah. what this this smart track bill would do is set parameters. A, a trade agreement will not get through smart track unless it meets parameters around labor law, uh, environmental law, and enforceability law. So that's what they're saying. But until we see something in writing, it's all smoke and mirrors right. to mm -hmm. me. Right. And I would like to have something in writing. I would like to have a specific stance and it's really impossible for, you know, it's very easy for our congressional representatives to say, well, I haven't seen it, so I can't tell you if I'm for it or against it. Mm -hmm. right. But right. all the things that are leaked out, come on. Yeah. Well, and, and on one level, I mean, from, from my point of view, and to some degree, I, I mean, Sierra Club believes in responsible trade uh, and is very interested. Our national people who are working on this are very interested in seeing, they've been engaged with Senator mm -hmm. Wyden's office, yeah. uh, actually sent a letter saying here's some things that we'd like to see. Right. You know, remains to be seen if that will happen. The fear, of course, is that this is all just uh, to, to, to adapt an, an old saying, this is all just like putting um, lipstick on a wolverine. Right. I mean, these, which you could, that could be tough on your fingers trying to do that. They're, they have, they have <laughs> that some pretty, tough. they have some pretty good teeth. And, yeah, they it's, do. and, and these corporate agreements have just been devastating to so many economies, so many people, so many working people, uh, so many um, ecological areas. Um, and the attempts that have been made to date to apply sane labor standards sane environmental standards to give people a chance to make a true living uh, it, it, as a component of these massive corporate trade agreements have just been been terrible and, and the problem I mean there is there is one member of the Oregon delegation who, who agrees that these are sour deals and that's Peter DeFazio mm -hmm. he believes that we should get out of the World Trade Organization uh, now he's one of you know I think a handful of members of Congress yeah. who've been willing to say that, mm -hmm. but the problem with Senator Wyden, Representative Blumenauer, Representative Bonamici, uh, Representative Schrader, to some degree, and Representative Walden, I and mean, he's, Representative he's Walden. totally. Yeah. It's about the wheat farmers uh -huh. for him yeah. in these trade agreements. But they bought into this deal, this idea of huge corporate deals, and that's part of what we need to change. Yes. Oh, right. Yeah. So we've got only four more minutes left. And so uh, I, I wanted to make the point with regard to the smart track is that if the smart track still leaves in place the requirements uh, that the president gets to sign the agreement before it's presented to Congress, that the amount of time that Congress gets to actually consider and debate these agreements, if those requirements are still in place under smart track, then we just still have fast track in place and we need to reject it. Yes, okay. I agree absolutely, okay. absolutely. Okay, it, it, so, so I, I, I know that you also wanted to talk briefly about a climate convergence, which is, will actually be happening in New York City the day this, this program actually broadcasts. So talk, talk about that for a minute. And in Portland. Let's, yes. not, let's not forget. Uh, the People's Climate March will be here in Portland as well on the 21st. Tom McCall Waterfront Park um, at the, uh, the south end close to uh, the, the Hawthorne Bridge. Uh, 3 p.m. Sunday, September 21st. Uh, it'll be the biggest march since I think the big Occupy March um, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, or perhaps the anti-Monsanto uh, uh, March. Uh, mm -hmm. So we're, and it's, we're uh, so be there or be square. Yeah. It's it's it, this is huge. I mean, communication workers nationally uh, endorsed it. Was one of the thousand groups that said yes, this is totally necessary, and our local here has endorsed it as well. And it's really important for people to come. It's not. It's about saving the planet for the future of our children and grandchildren and great grandchildren. It, 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 there are no jobs if the climate changes Absolutely. the way it's going to in the next 10 years if we don't stop it. Right. 
And this is, this is the reason and the basis of the continuing to evolve alliance of green mm -hmm. and blue. We're all in this together. Yes. <clears throat> I mean, we all bleed red and we all breathe the same atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and we have to understand that commonwealth concept that struck me so much with these, these great filmmakers from Pennsylvania. Uh, if, if we don't live up to that spirit, uh, what was the Revolutionary War line from Benjamin Franklin? Um, unless we all hang together, we shall certainly all hang separately <laughs> after yes. King George said that any rebel was going to be hung. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. It's, yeah. and it, it's yeah. been ever thus. So I am going to unfortunately call this conversation to an end. Thank you, Madeline, for being here. Yay. Thank you, Ted. Thank you, David. Okay, great. Good. Our pleasure. Good. So our guests today have been Madeline Elder, president of Local 7901 of the Communication Workers of America, and Ted Gleichman, chair of the Beyond LNG Committee of the Oregon Sierra Club. Portland Alliance for Democracy is proud to sponsor an appearance by Jeff Clemens, founder of Free Speech for People and author of Corporations Are Not People, Reclaiming Democracy from Big Money and Global Corporations, now in its second edition. Attorney Jeff Clemens shows how we, the people, can fight back in the face of such, such Supreme Court decisions as Citizens United, McCutcheon versus FEC, and Hobby Lobby, which gave corporations First Amendment religious freedom rights based on the erroneous principle that corporations are people with constitutional rights. So please join the Alliance for Democracy and Oregon Common Cause on October 10th, 7 p.m. at the First Unitarian Church, Southwest 12th and Salmon in downtown Portland. A donation is requested, but no one will be turned away for lack of cash. Populist Dialogues is a project of the, of the Portland Alliance for Democracy. Learn more about us at afd-pdx.org and about our national organization at thealliancefordemocracy.org. Thanks to Roger Bates, Brad Leach, Janet Morris, Ethan Scowell, uh, and Tom Thomas for their volunteer time getting us on the air. And to all of you watching, thank you. I hope that we will see you again in two weeks. Bye. <music> If you think corporations bought free speech before Now that they're human, they'll buy even more Yeah, their money has free speech to me, quite a shock Cause I never heard my money talk When a corporation has a colonoscopy Then I'll believe they're human like me